developing scientific theories. Before we can introduce a new scientific application or technology into society, scientists develop scientific theories. A theory provides a logical explanation about why things happen as they do. A theory's acceptance is built upon using the scientific method. For many facts, observations or problems, we can develop scientific questions. We may then have multiple hypotheses or testable explanations competing to answer the scientific question. Each hypothesis can be used to launch a scientific inquiry, making a prediction, collecting evidence, which is then used to analyse and review before deciding whether the data does or doesn't support the explanation. If the data doesn't support the explanation given by the original hypothesis, we may have to go back and start considering other explanations. Or, if the data does support the hypothesis, then we can accept it and put this understanding towards a larger body of evidence to develop a scientific theory. Theories can help us predict previously unobserved phenomena. For example, Mendeleev's theory of leaving gaps in the periodic table for elements that hadn't yet been discovered was a theory that allowed for scientific knowledge and evidence to be further filled in in the future. Some theories can also be very new ideas that so far have very little evidence for. So scientists and the public should view those with caution and maybe even scrutinise them or consider rejecting those theories. Other theories which have much larger bodies of evidence behind them and have withstood rigorous testing, criticism and evaluation over time are the ones that will become widely accepted. For example, we have lots of evidence to show us that climate change is occurring on our planet. We also have lots of different theories and evidence for evolution. So these are widely accepted theories among the scientific community. When developing scientific ideas, models are often used to better explain or understand different ideas. Although not a full simulation of reality, scientists spend a lot of time refining these models so that they best represent a simplified version of reality. A representational model is using familiar objects to explain reality. For example, this bell jar model uses a glass jar balloons and a rubber sheet to model the action of the diaphragm, changing the volume and pressure in the thorax to ventilate the lungs. It helps us understand what's happening in the body and how different parts work together. Spatial models provide a view of microscopic structures, such as molecules and their different bonds within them, using molecular kits. Or you may have seen models of the different structures that come together to build a DNA molecule, like this. Descriptive models use words and images to illustrate or help paint a picture in your mind about something. For example, we can draw the atomic structure of atoms or write chemical equations to represent reactions and the relationship between the different elements in the reactants and products. Mathematical models help us describe, calculate and predict the behaviour of components in a system. There are lots of equations you have to know for science and they help us predict the behaviour of objects. Scientists are still working hard to refine our estimations of the age of the universe. Studying cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMBR, seen in this image here, left over from some of the oldest bodies in the universe, is aiding the calculation of a mathematical expansion rate for the universe, known as the Hubble constant. From this mathematical model, scientists can start to work backwards and determine the age of the universe. So mathematical models can be very powerful for increasing our understanding. Computational models are a type of mathematical model, but they use computers to simulate and study the behaviour of very complex systems using a mixture of mathematics, 
physics and computer science. Computational models are used by the Met Office for forecasting the weather or can be used to study the interaction and breakdown of drugs in the body to identify safe dosages before trialling on whole animals or humans. As we said, during the process of the scientific method, after scientists have conducted a comprehensive investigation, they need to be able to communicate their work to others. To allow the work of research scientists to be understood by other scientists, researchers write scientific papers that should clearly communicate their method, results, analysis and conclusions. Other expert scientists in this area can then carefully evaluate the paper and make comments or suggestions or improvements. This process is called peer review. Scientists may then communicate their conclusions to relevant industry professionals where their conclusions may be influential. For example, doctors may use scientific discoveries to help them make informed decisions about patient treatment. Further sharing within the scientific community through events such as conferences, and if the research was conducted at a university, the university students may be taught these new advances in their lectures. Some scientific discoveries may have an impact on the lives of the general public. So reporting of science through media and news journals can further communicate the research to a wider audience. This is why it's important that scientists make sure they communicate their findings and the implications of their conclusions very clearly. Otherwise, journalists may misinterpret the research or present a biased view or oversimplified version of the scientific work. Here's an example in biology of how theories have developed and continue to develop. In 2010, an international team of scientists published a data review of lots of evidence put together over 20 years and agreed that the extinction of the dinosaurs was caused by an asteroid colliding with Earth in Mexico around 65 million years ago. Not long after this theory was published came the suggestion that dinosaurs actually became extinct around 137 million years ago, occurring at a much slower rate than previously thought. With evidence from fossils and minerals in Norway, this theory suggests that sea ice melting caused flooding of the Earth's seas and oceans. With very cold water, there was a drop in sea temperature, triggering the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. So both of these theories show how evidence-based theories can lead to different explanations for the same thing. And as we continue to develop our understanding, It may be that both historical events contributed to the mass extinction of dinosaurs. However, we need much more, we need even more evidence to be gathered and analysed to be sure of these claims. An example of the development of a theory in chemistry is the development of our understanding of atomic structure through the atomic model. John Dalton, in the early 1800s, used experiments to develop his atomic theory including some fundamental ideas that all matter is made of atoms and that these atoms can rearrange in chemical reactions. Further down the line, in 1897, J.J. Thompson used his investigations to propose the plum pudding model of the atom, explaining why atoms have no overall charge. In 1911, Rutherford's experiments gave us further insight into the positioning of electrons surrounding a positively charged core of the atom. And finally, Bohr's experiments in 1913 gave us an even clearer distinction our electrons were found in specific energy levels or shells around the positively charged nucleus. And finally, in physics, we have developed our understanding of gravity greatly The Aristotelian explanation of gravity is that all bodies have a natural tendency to fall towards the centre of the universe. So Aristotle generally hypothesised that the Earth was the centre of this universe, a geocentric view. However, moving forward to the 17th century, in the mid-17th century, Kepler produced work on the laws of planetary motion in orbits. Around 50 years, 
before Newton providing a mathematical model for Kepler's laws. Further development of our understanding of gravity came from Einstein in the 20th century, who suggested gravity is due to the curvature of space and time, so explaining that gravity is exactly equivalent to acceleration in his theory of general relativity. And even now, in the 21st century, we are making advances in our understanding of gravitational waves, detecting these from distant bodies within our universe. This example shows us how developments in our understanding across a very long time scale have helped us critique previous experience and evidence and refine mathematical models to predict the behaviour of bodies within our universe. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a like. And if you have any questions, leave a comment below. Subscribe to our channel to check out more of Century's content and visit our website to find out about our learning platform.